Welcome back to ASL Connect's lecture series, appearing for the first time virtually. My name is Keith Grant, Jr., and I will be the facilitator for today's event. Today's event is truly exciting. We will have some, a question and answer period at the end, and you can type any questions that you have in the Q&A box. We're here today to learn more about a book that is just pre-published at this moment, Two Feathers, a bilingual publication, a format using both ASL and English. We're going to learn more about the team that's made it, their roles, and the process of making this bilingual production. We hope that this series will continue to inspire the creation of more bilingual stories, books, and films. And now we'll see more of Two Feathers and throughout our panel today, Two Friends, and throughout our panel today, we'll be discussing Two Friends. Susan was a self-taught woman who traveled throughout the country like Shereen. She continues to travel across the country. We also have Frederick. And Frederick's perfect vision was this. Now we are all brethren. In right, there's a no color. Wow, that was so fun. I'd like to welcome now, Francisca Rangel, an ASL teacher, teacher at Kindle Demonstration School at Clare Center. If you tell us now a little more about what inspired you to create this project, please join me in welcoming Francisca. Thank you so much, Keith, it's great to be here. So I have a number of questions to ask you today. What inspired you to create this project? Well, truly the inspiration came from me knowing that there's a lot of stories out there and wanting them to be translated into ASL. Uh, I specifically some uh, stories really because of the upcoming election this past November and the resurgence of Black Lives Matter. I realized that I could not undertake this by myself. So I engaged in discussion with two team members. As I pitched the idea uh, to Franklin to be one of the people that will be signing on video with me, translating stories. And that's what really inspired me. I also didn't feel right to do it alone. So it was great to have uh, Franklin with me. Wow. You know, there are so many storybooks in ASL out there now. Why make another one? So we have a limited number of those stories that are multicultural and address issues of race, which is very much in need with the current context that we're living in, specifically those translated in ASL. Uh, so having deaf authors uh, who have multicultural perspectives and social justice perspectives. It's something that was quite lacking, and that's why I wanted to do this. So these themes need to be more readily available to the deaf community. So I'm thrilled that ASL Connect. Indeed. Uh, decided to uh, create more books and more translations. So I'm very happy to see this. Thing. Agreed. Now, the last question I have for you today, what ripple effects do you hope to see this project create? Well, as I mentioned, uh, wanting more deaf authors. I know there are the authors, deaf authors are there that, that mm. do their, their, their art and their writing of storybooks yet they shelve it and they don't uh, take it to publication. However, we want to take this to publications. And uh, have these publications that are 
accessible in language that are within the context of the deaf community and deaf culture and that share and we spotlight different cultures and, and diverse and the diverse uh, population that we have in the deaf community. So deaf children have someone that they can look up to that looks like them, that they can connect to, that they can see themselves reflected in. Uh, so hopefully we will be able to collect more writings from deaf authors to have these stories uh, in ASL, uh, to have uh, people showcase their life experiences and their experiences around race. I do know some deaf authors out there, so I'm hoping that to nudge them and have them send them me some of their writings. Amazing, and you're right, the time is right. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Now is indeed the time, right, for the creation of more bilingual media for our youth. Now, I wanna dig a little deeper into the bilingual process of creating this. So with that, I wanted to invite Tammy Murther, Murphy, who is one of the uh, coordinators of the bilingual projects here and working with Kathy Nutter. Now, unfortunately, Tammy was unable to join us today, but in lieu of that, we have already asked a number of questions and gotten a pre-recorded version of that. We have Guthrie Nutter, who was the coordinator of marketing and program development for the project. And they, in this video, will discuss the bilingual process that they engaged in. Uh, well, hello, how are you doing there? Doing great. I'm ready to talk about our story, two friends. I know, and now, adding a sixth book to this edition, you know, and having finished five working on this new one in development. Right, I'm so happy that we were able to start the first one with Joseph Santini and Francisca and him, uh, but, and having more stories that represent diverse cultures. However, uh, many of the ones that were out there previously didn't really address culture in any way. And since May uh, and, the, and the murder of George mm -hmm. Floyd and the resurgence of Black Lives Matter, I think it was crucial okay. that Claire Center felt that it was of utmost importance to begin exposing deaf children to uh, what is happening in our country. And the term resilience has appeared so much in these narratives, so much dependent upon persistence. And so many of these narratives give a sing-song version of the world, but nothing of real import for our children to really learn the life lessons of finding identification in others, finding representation in their media, and now having these kinds of literature creates a new context for them. And also having versions that are in American Sign Language. A lot of it, uh, when we look at the news and when we look at uh, the media, it's all written based or English based, but being able to film these stories in ASL that showcase and represent Black culture and Black lives, specifically the two friends story. And now that we've added six more uh, stories that are multicultural and represent uh, various paths in life. Uh, and both Francisca and Franklin were the signers to that for that story, two friends. It was absolutely fascinating, especially with this restrictions around COVID and not oh. being together in the same room, yeah. Uh, and being able to see each other while they're filming, but they could only see their profile. It was definitely challenging because of COVID. So we practiced with Franklin and Francisca. The three of us got together to see how we felt about the story. So online, not physically getting together, I got you. Correct, virtually, the three of us that were able to connect. And uh, we brainstormed, and then we began the filming process. Uh, you and myself were, were at home watching them uh, through video while they were in the studio recording and it was just the signers and the camera person, that's it. And among the discussions that we were having during the translations, one of the signers said that they felt that uh, the book represented an African-American individual. However, uh, they didn't want to sign uh, standard ASL or white ASL, they wanted to sign black ASL. And my position as a bilingual educator, uh, and I, I am a content, content uh, matter, uh, subject matter expert in translations from ASL and English, but not a cultural expert in translations to black ASL uh, that fit that specific cultural frame. So we thought right. about perhaps bringing a cultural content specialist, which we did, 
we ended up hiring the cultural content specialist. I cannot even tell you what an incredible experience that was. Indeed. And I'd add to that that what was so amazing about this was that it was a transformation of the workspace. You know, the we had both the Black author, the Black cultural content specialist, the videographer, the pre-meeting, all of us came together to really discuss the direction, how the filming would take place, how all of this would play out. And when things came up, you know, we made sure that we had access to those, you know, really important, very real conversations to put everything on the table for us. And to have had that opportunity for that conversation, it typically falls to somebody who is merely in their discipline to control their discipline and nothing else. And the consultant does the consulting, the videographer does the videography. But in this, it was such an interplay of everyone at work that we were each creating a space together, co-creating this truth in the language. And that, you know, there, there's there been this notion that there's this all white uh, workforce without the BIPOC presence that is so vital and, and that was present in this production and it completely changed the energy and shows how important it is. Every one of you who is out there thinking of pursuing production, pursuing anything like this, please respect the communities you're working with, get them to be active participants and co-creators of the content you're working with. The viewers will know that, it will resonate with them. And the importance of that can't be overstated. So prior to working on two friends that didn't have any experiences working with cultural content specialists, uh, however, as I watched the content cultural specialists work with designers and providing their consultation to them, uh, I realized that that was not the role for me. Uh, I am a translation specialist. Uh, so uh, my role was merely just reminding the age level of who will be receiving the story. But having the cultural content specialist uh, providing that support uh, towards signers, it made me realize that it was very much needed and I was not the person that should have done that. And I'm happy that we had that specialist. And the fact that it was just so authentic and organic, the process that the signers went through with the cultural content specialist that made the space just be comfortable for everyone who was participating. And this is something that needs to be a standard moving forward. Uh, it's not a want, it's a must from here on. Absolutely, and we really worked to lay out the best practices for this moving forward. So my position as a bilingual educator here at the Clare Center, uh, I want to make sure that we have available three versions of these stories. Prior to COVID-19, a lot of ASL stories, there were a lot of ASL stories out there. There were phenomenal ASL stories that were uh, published. However, after COVID and, and the limitation of school children being at home, and we really want to be able to still provide that bilingual education, we also need to provide them access with English versions of these stories. So we decided to go with three versions. One version that was purely ASL without captions, just American Sign Language. The second version was in ASL with English captions at the top. However, the ASL even added more uh, substance uh, within the story than just what the captions were giving you. So I think, uh, and now we very much uh, want to make sure that the children have this bilingual access. We also uh, added image descriptions as well, uh, what the characters look like in the story. And that was part of the ASL version and that did not show up in the caption. And we also included voiceover in that second version from provided by D-Pen. Um, maybe for audiology students or parents who have deaf children are able to engage with their children while also using these stories. The third version is one that was purely in English. And that way we have all of these options for anyone who wants to access it in whatever language. 
and we are still able to maintain this bilingual approach and support our students and our curriculum while we are in this remote setting. Really amazing collaboration there with the Clare Center and so wonderful to see all that's happening there with ASL Connect and the Clare Center. The collaborations that we've created here are amazing. Great things are happening and it's been an honor. Very much looking forward to the way that also CODAs have access to, to, to these materials as well. Uh, having six or, uh, or seven books now, I very much look forward to having more books that uh, showcase different cultures and different backgrounds. That are intersectional, absolutely. A hundred percent, yes. I uh, see a diverse group of signers in, this, in the stories. Uh, that is the way people can see themselves reflected in the stories as well. We need to keep the momentum going. We need to keep growing this. We need to keep collecting this uh, uh, or creating these ASL signing books. Right. It, it's not only the end product that matters so much, also the process. That's the purpose of coming together today is to share a little more about our process so that others can emulate that and continue the work and in fact, improve upon it so that nobody has to reinvent the wheel. These experiences have created a contextual language that is vibrant and rich. And I don't think I've ever seen anything like the kind of image descriptions and rich detail embedded in both the ASL English and audio versions of any media. This kind of bilingual experience is amazing. So exciting. And that editing process was really interesting. We used Motion Array, right? Remember the work that we did with that where we could stamp, time stamp each instance on the film, coded for English, coded. And so much of this was heavily conceptual. A lot of that discussion happened via Marco Polo app, right? And Loom as well. <laughs> right, Loom, yes. Yeah, it was very interesting working with the editor. Uh, they are so creative, so patient, uh, especially with me giving so much input. Uh, it was months worth of work, but a beautiful product. Thank you. So thank you so thank much, you. To the editors. Yes. Uh, it was also a great experience being able to work outside of the Clare Center. Oftentimes, we only have the opportunity to work amongst our colleagues at the Clare Center, but being able to connect with people like Galadet, with ASL Connect, at DPAN, meeting different talent for the signing, uh, working with Felicia Williams and Asia Washington Shepard as uh, their language directors. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, again, an incredible group of people. Uh, and again, the experience of having the opportunity to work outside of uh, the Clare Center was great. Truly a sense of community. All of us coming together to co-create something so profound. Hello, everyone. Yes. Wow. That is fascinating. And it really drives home the importance of having the work of ASL Connect. Francisca, would you like to share some more about this? Yes. So being able to have these stories for children uh, at all ages, for the community, high school children, elementary school children, and be able to showcase live experiences, having them in multiple languages accessible to everyone, and having representation. Uh, I think it's definitely uh, important. One of the books definitely does that. I think that's uh, great. Also, some of these great, great cute, this is, some of these are not cute stories. Uh, these were uh, or, uh, these are uh, just uh, children's stories. They were written by high school students who, and specifically talked about the little girl that misses her mom. Oh, wow. A high school student wrote this. So it's, it's, really, it's a true story. It's some serious work went into writing this story. And again, it's a for all ages. And again, representation is incredibly important. And there's so many more stories out there that have yet to be written. 
And I look forward to seeing more of those. And to be honest with you, oftentimes the writing process can be painful. It is painful for me at times. It does take time to unpack and be able to put pen to paper. But I'm thrilled that ASL Connect uh, is working with us at the Clare Center to make this happen. Thank you. Tony. Absolutely. And we feel just the same as you. Thank you so much, Francisca. So, with that, I'd now like to introduce Franklin Jones, one of the on-screen performers who works at Gallaudet University in the ASL department as well, who's worked part of the on-screen talent. Thank you so much, Franklin. Hi. So I have some questions for you as well. What was the experience of being on-screen talent during an era of COVID with physical distancing like? Sure. Um, you know, normally, well, naturally when COVID came out, everyone was fearful and thinking about social distancing and whether or not it was safe to be around one another. But after entering the environment, I see that they've already had measures put in place for social distancing. So, you know, the first time I thought to myself, how's that gonna work? You know, you're supposed to be six feet apart. Uh, I know that everything else can work, you know, remotely, but once we realized what accommodations were in place, it was a pretty good experience. And what about for you, Francisca? Fairly similar to Franklin. However, uh, not having access to a printer, I do like to have the paper material with me. Oh. Uh, and they were, announced, there were so many pages in the script and having to do all of it on the computer, that was definitely an awkward experience for me. Uh, I did actually go to Gallaudet and I printed the script and that was much easier to be able to practice uh, before the recording. But uh, realizing that restriction of just not having a printer, how it can make it much more challenging. Uh, I thought I was going to be alone. I knew I was going to, I went, I went alone to Gallaudet just to ensure that I was, uh, everyone was safe uh, due to COVID. And then during the filming, when we had to go virtually and have all of our lines memorized, uh, it was mm. just an experience. Wow, amazing. Another question for you. During the filming process and in the performance of your stories, how did that go having to adapt during the, the performance as you went? Yeah, it really helped that I already had prepared. So it was kind of in me because of all the practice that I've done. Uh, I think there was a piece on Harriet Tubman I did, but I had already rehearsed it enough to the point where, like I said, I could just recall that. Uh, so when I got called in to, to film, I already had it. I think the only difference was that, you know, I had to work remotely. Um, and it, usually it's in a space where you can work with other people, but I had to do it on my own, send the film in. You know, and after sending my film in, like what Tammy mentioned earlier, we'd get feedback and then make certain changes that need to be made. Uh, however, when it comes to the preparation and that process, that was a great benefit that allowed me to really capture the story. Wow, what a different approach. Francisca, more to add? Uh, yes, again, just like Franklin, uh, doing it via Zoom, it was a bit of a challenge and it felt a little bit unnatural and sending it over uh, to, to the producers, that was most definitely a challenge working remotely. So one last question to ask you. So again, being the on-screen performer there, what's that? Uh, okay, so during the filming, how did you adapt to camera location, things like that? Did that prompt any changes? Definitely. Franklin? Yeah, definitely. You gotta know which camera you're looking at. You know, sometimes the camera's set up on the right or the left. So depending on what part of the story you're in, you gotta know what angle you should be looking at. Now, generally I try my best to kind of follow my gut and think what would make the most sense. And that wasn't too bad. But for the, for the scene where I had that small cup, you know, it was kind of, uh, I wasn't sure exactly which way to look when I was doing that. And I was trying to think about, you know, how it looked on camera. So in certain instances, it was a little bit of a challenge. Ah, Francisca? 
So there was the translation process at the same time taking into account the different camera angles, uh, getting multiple perspectives on the potential translation or interpretation of the source. It was just a fascinating process. I learned so much. Uh, I felt like for so long I was my mind was colonized by, by the hearing world and I was able to free up the way I express myself throughout this discussion of some translation process. I do, however, suggest that everyone continues using this type of process to create these stories. As you look at um, the books, just like a virtual book that you're able to navigate uh, online and you're able to and go through the entire story in a much more visual animated way, I think wow. it's great and we should continue it and it's great for children. Oh, Franklin. Yeah, one thing I wanted to add was the challenge is if you move the wrong way out of the, out of the uh, mark for the camera, you have to redo the whole video. So once you move, you have to reset. And that's one thing you have to remember. And it's uh, important for you to not move because the cameras have been set up to your body kind of um, specifications. Thank you so much, Franklin, Francisca. Thank you. Oh, Francisca, something else? Really, and the experience also translated into me doing better at my own personal job with working with children at the Clare Center. Wow. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Wonderful. Now, seeing this on-screen talent, how they had to adapt and to make sure they had multiple camera angles and all the work that went into creating this bilingual content is amazing. So moving forward, we want to look at how many people it takes to create this kind of wonderful content, to create more authentic content and representation. With that, I want to invite two people now to the screen. Naisha Washington. Shepard and Felicia Williams. So, first of all, Naisha is an instructor at Gallaudet University and also co director of the program there, and is also serving as on screen talent as well as director for ASO Connect content. And she's the director for the MASLEB program. So, she was unable to be with us for the event today. So in lieu of that, we have pre-recorded responses to our questions. The questions that we asked were about her role at working with the ASL content and examining that as well as her role in directing. Okay. Well, I really had two different roles because I worked as the director as well as on screen talent. So I'd say that that was, oh, Again, such an experience. And so different from my day-to-day -day work, teaching, interpreting. It was a very different role that sparked a great deal of thought. But we gathered together such a robust team. One thing that did really take me by surprise and, and give me pause was thinking about how to give this kind of really detailed feedback. And... You know, there, there were other team members at work here, you know, the media people, the cinematographer, everybody with their own needs. There's uh, clothing, wardrobe. There's just the tiniest details that I might look at a scene and think it's fine, but the people examining the scene in frame see it differently. They see it up close. They have a different perspective on it. And so uh, I would be distracted with their thoughts on, on the scene and get it set, and I would get some direction from them that I have to pass on as a director, make decisions on give feedback on the presentation and then maybe there were times when as talent you know i felt like oh that i nailed that but then there was a line missing which meant you know i had to get the book there and so get the line i need a line and just working together as a team was so important to this now one thing that did frustrate me at times was where i would find the nuanced thing about it that wasn't right and the team thought it was all right and then it, we needed to change it no matter what you know, you can rehearse as much as you want, but when it comes time to do the performance, sometimes if the lighting is just a little different, it just sets it off wrong and it just changes it. And so I, 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 they might think the product was fine, but I felt it needed changing and refining. So working with that, 
until uh, other times I think everything was nailed. It was perfection in a shot. And they said, no, it feels off. And then I've got to make the call. Who's right? There were some tough calls to make. You know, do I go to battle with the camera? Do I go to battle with the opinion of the other folks? What do I do here? And then I'd have to really think about it. And I had to ask the work, ask the work. Is the work right? Is this it? Is this what it's supposed to be? And that really was critical. And at the same time, this whole experience was one of rapid decision making and a lot of fun. And just, I was so enthusiastic all the way through. A few things in particular that you know, I'd worked on. I am enough before this, as well as So We, which is the story of a young, beautiful, dark-skinned girl, and then the and whose name means an African star. And then the third work that I'd worked on part of this was Mirror. And then that one I'd done as a director. So I am enough. I worked as a director. The other one, So We, I worked as on-screen talent. <laughs> amazing, amazing experience. They are all beautiful books and I love them. Now, what is so resonant is there's black experience there and something in me cries out, yes, yes, that's it. This sings to me and I'm proud to be doing this work, proud to be part of this project and part of this team. I can't contain that much pride. Wonderful, amazing. And all of the rehearsals that take place up to this and then to have to shift right there on the spot and go in new directions with it. So another question, your role as director and also with the ASL and cultural content there, tell me more about what inspired that role. Okay, a little about my duties. There were two different positions. One was as consultant, we're discussing the content itself. The other was the director role, wherein I've got to make the changes, give the feedback, make sure the content gets made right. So in one role, there's more the action of getting in there, digging into the translation and having the cultural uh, competencies and the consultant there to feed into that creates a richer translation. So sometimes I'd have to be back there in that other role. And then I think of one as the role where I'm sitting there thinking about the work and the other where I'm up there and doing the work in a very different way. But the work of translation is so valuable. That experience has really taught me to think through how you place the audience at the forefront. What this means to me is something that I have to dig into fully realize so that I can embody those characters and give life to that representation and dig into it's inferred meaning, make that really explicit and clear. And so that it's not merely letters on a page, but a landscape presented live for the viewing audience. So that it's something that as you read so often, you create a mental landscape. I wanted that landscape to be alive on the screen for these deaf students and deaf readers all across the world. There's so much need for ASO content out there. There's so much existing English content. So what I want is to bring these worlds of imagination that exist. It is our duty to bring those to life for these audiences of young children, adults, and all the viewers, you know, uh, people who are learning ASL later in life, people who have lost their hearing later in life, people who have been born deaf and raised with the language. It, this content is important to all of them, and I'm so proud to be a performer and director for it. And when I've had to sit down and dig into the book and get into other people's heads about the translation, about the meaning of the work, I, it's something that brings out more detail and more richness until I have a confident hold on the meaning and can work on the rehearsal. I would say I average four times of, of full rehearsals over say two hour sessions each time of rehearsals until I feel on the ball, ready to go. And then that day I set my target to try to keep it tight, you know, not to go in and just do a hundred takes. You know, I try to get in there with the mentality. I've done the practice. I'm here to do it. It's time to do it and do it. And then that day, you know, usually it's around six hours, four to five hours sometimes in a session. And my performance time was one thing that I'm thinking of it in one way, but then I have to put on my director's hat. And then that 
brings totally different level to the work, a different level of critique and thought. And, you know, it's not easy to critique my own translation that way. And I have to see whether it landed the way I meant to throw it. And, you know, the day of filming, you know, it's not just that I practice it beforehand. And still, I think, yeah, and, you know, something comes up there in the performance and in the translation that you have to tweak, you have to change it, you have to work with it. And you just never know how you're going to have to fine tune this. You really got to take detailed notes. And it's both your job as the director and the performer's job to take detailed notes on what this is going to be. And now when I take my notes, we do video notes back and forth. It's an iterative process. It goes back and forth and so that we've got it. And even though I'm a director, I really do the same thing with myself as an on-screen talent. I think it's amazing. Probably one of the first times I've had this kind of experience where I've been the on-screen talent and also sitting back in this other role. And it's been one that I've really enjoyed. I've enjoyed this experience. I'd, I'd say I want more of it. <laughs> uh, this isn't enough. More. Yeah, I'm going to direct more in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely fascinating learning about the nitty gritty that goes into this translation process. I think this is crucial information. I now want to welcome Felicia Williams. Hello, Felicia. Felicia is an ASL professor at Galileo University in the Department of ASL and Deaf Studies. Uh, she was the coordinator for cultural content for the ASL storybooks. Welcome, Felicia. Thank so you. I do have a couple of questions for you. In your role as ASL cultural and content specialist, uh, and also with the filming experience, uh, can you tell me how your position benefits and apply to this process during the filming and production? Wow, uh, there's a lot there. Um, I mean, this was a new experience for me. And when they asked me to be a part of the project, you know, of course, I was delighted to and I, I felt compelled to, but I can remember myself going through different translation process and reading books. We didn't really have anything like the space we have now where we can capitalize on that opportunity. And we also have skilled signers who are part of the translation process. And we're very intentional with how and when we do certain things, how we set up the cameras, you know, when to work on Zoom, when to utilize other apps like Marco Polo. Uh, to send feedback and, and quick messages. Um, as it was shared earlier, I think having that cultural content and you know, being represented in that book with ASL very clearly, very visually, you know, expanding on what some of the metaphors truly mean and taking a deeper dive into the content. A lot of the time I found myself really wrestling with what would be the most appropriate word choice. And when we're talking about BIPOC topics, you know, what does that look like? And the result is really from gathering input from various members of the community before getting on camera. Now, there are times when, you know, I would sign something on camera, but not be content or satisfied with what I produced. Uh, there would be some times where, you know, on a certain day, I would think that I'm, you know, good to go. And when it's time to be on camera, I'm noticing that, you know, there are certain parts of my face that are not reflected the way that I want it to be seen. So sometimes I've got to make slight adjustments Sometimes I have to uh, turn my shoulders a certain way to lean towards the camera to be easier seen. So there's a lot of nuances that go into it. Um, and often in this work, I would correspond with someone else. And it, it almost meant that the non-BIPOC people were in a separate Zoom room. So I would you know, get ideas from BIPOC folks. And I also wanted to make sure that I represented Black ASL and ensure that there was adequate cultural um, you know, representation in the product and have members from the community really feel like they're represented in what they see. So there was so much context that went into it. And I would lean on that context to inform what my sign choices would be on camera. And if there were times that someone would pop up on the camera with me, visually, it just wasn't um, the best quality to do it that way. I thought that having just one person on camera would allow that, you know, that sameness, that bond, that connection from the viewer. Now, as a signer, you know, the people who, well, the person I got feedback from was Nye, which was awesome. Uh, we were able to really go back and forth based on the books. Um, and Marco Polo was, was the best way for us to go about sharing that feedback. And when it was time to produce something, you know, it just felt like it was a different product 
after working with Nye through Marco Polo. So that was an awesome experience, you know, being able to have folks that are, you know, BIPOC plus non-BIPOC giving their, you know, perspective. And we also had it set up to where they would only see me on the video. So that was very helpful in ensuring that the cultural representation was there. And I have to say overall, the filming uh, process was very positive. Uh, Lauren Brown was a part of the process, although in a different room, you know, she was there and, you know, to be able to see a black or brown body there was just very refreshing and it and allowed for that kind of connection to be made. And that connection led to me just feeling much more comfortable. Uh, there was really no stress that I can remember, you know, because I, I was representing someone that looks like me. So it was nice to be able to have that conversation and, and have that experience. And I feel like the signing actually went pretty well. Wow, that sounds incredible. I do have a final question for you. Um, so for what advice would you give to productions that plan to feature uh, BIPOC or uh, multicultural or deaf uh, cultural content uh, type of productions? What advice do you have for them? Well, from the books that I was able to read, uh, I guess the advice I would share is this. I would strongly encourage you to please use a BIPOC consultant who can have that cultural uh, relevance, who comes from that culture. Because otherwise, you know, people aren't sure if what they're, what they're putting on camera truly represents what they want to be represented in the most authentic way. So you really wanna make sure you got BIPOC people in there, members from the community um, serving as consultants and being able to give guidance on what certain word choice should look like, you know, language uh, based decisions. And it's not that I'm the only decision maker when it comes to these instances. You know, if there's ever a situation that I find myself stuck, I know that there's other people who are culturally competent that I can also reach out to. So in this process, it's key, you know, knowing when to make certain decisions and, mm -hmm. you know, being that this was a safe space, uh, it, was, it was such that I was able to make certain artistic decisions versus a non-BIPOC person making those decisions for me. So I wanted to have full kind of artistic control over what, was, you know, what I was producing, what I envisioned. And I think my advice to you again, when it comes to translating from books, don't have non-BIPOC people making those decisions. You wanna give BIPOC you know, the agency to, to make those decisions. Uh, if there's more context that's needed or information that's needed, additional information, you know, those are some things that, you know, you can add in, but for the most part, we want to have the substantive consulting coming from BIPOC folks. You know, when it comes to lang their language, it's their space. You know, we need not fix that. And uh, I think that will allow the authentic process to really blossom. In a nutshell, this whole experience is awesome. I mean, the book was phenomenal and I truly hope to see more of this. I think this is really a, a starting point for a trailblazing kind of activity. And I'm looking forward to, you know, the direction of this and, you know, seeing how certain decisions and details are made as it relates to the work that I did here and also tying in members of the BIPOC community so that we can make our decisions together. So I think that's how I'd summarize what advice I'd give and I look forward and I'm excited to doing more. Thank you for that advice. And that role of that consultant is so important. It's something that I, as a white person, could never authentically bring to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you. Now, with that, it's fascinating how important it is to bring that ASO competency and cultural competency to the table. Next, I'd like to look into that cinematographic uh, process. So with that, I want to invite Javier Taveras. Hello, everyone. So can you tell us a bit about what it's like to uh, work on this during this time? I have some questions for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, in the pre-COVID era, there was a way of going about building a set. But now, since the advent of COVID, what does a set build look like for you? Well, it was quite the change, if I may say so. Typically in an in-person setting, we have access to physically touch the equipment and be around one another. With COVID, clearly that is quite the risk. 
or ASL Connect office, uh, everyone went home and I was able to work there by myself uh, to turn it into a fully remote studio. It was quite an effective endeavor. And uh, the way it was set up as you walked into the room, actually, let me just show you. Oh, this wrong video. So if you can see, as you walked in, uh, because we would have a space for the filmmaker and a space for the talent. So actors would come into one space that you saw Mark, and that was the space where they were able to interact Ooh. with the ASL specialists without the presence of the, the cinema, cinematographer. Uh, and we were connected remotely with the rest of the team. Wow. To be able to engage uh, with the ASL director. And again, also for the actors and the directors to be able to have that interaction with one another, which is so important for the production. Often, if there was a break or we needed to leave the room, uh, there was an entrance for the talent and an entrance for the film uh, or the camera person. So we would not be in close contact. So we uh, also uh, set up a system so everyone could see themselves uh, while the production was being shot. That way everyone had access to what was happening in real time. The entire crew had monitors and videos where we could see everything in real time. Wow. Great. So the second question I have for you today is prior to COVID, you had a particular process for filming. Tell me a little more about what that process traditionally looked like and how does that compare with the post-COVID era for filming? Have you? I mean, you're absolutely right. It is definitely different. The clip that you all just saw, uh, within this, the confines of COVID-19, uh, we were able to set up a space that would allow us to do this in an efficient manner. So now with that, I'd like to bring in Lauren Brown. Ah, great, great to have you here. Hi. So Lauren, Lauren worked with ASL Connect with, as media digital specialist. So, if you could tell me a little more about your role in the editing there, that's going to be great. Great to have you here. And I have uh, some questions for the two of you. The first question is after the filming and the editing was done, tell me a little more about your post-production process and how different was that than the pre-COVID post-production? So I graduated from film school and they taught editing quite a bit and they relied heavily on Avid, which is a software editing program. And that's something that's very commonly used in the film industry. But, you know, Gallaudet is not considered to be a you know, huge member of the film community in that way. So when we talked about their teaching mm -hmm. methods, what I used was Adobe Creative Suite 
uh, which is their program, uh, AE After Effect and uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. Those two were more kind of uh, generally used, although there are some uh, certain degree of specializations for the most part, the everyday editor can use mm -hmm. those. Uh, for me, it was a huge shift from what I was taught in film school and everything that I knew. And, you know, it took me a while to learn how to use this Adobe stuff, but I was very fortunate to mm -hmm. uh, be on the board working with the ASL Connect team, especially during the times of, you know, COVID-19. I just, uh, I feel like I've been blessed to work with such an excellent team and I've been able to develop my skills in Adobe and uh, Premiere Pro. And I think that I'll become much more proficient with it over time. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Now, I believe we have a video to show. Like the sun, I'm here to shine. Black girl, brown hair, bunched up, with earrings, a white shirt with yellow dots, a set of jean overalls, blue shoes, yellow socks, and her light, her light shines. Like a ladder, here to climb. And like the air to rise above. Black hair, a black girl with black hair, with a red headband, a red shirt with white polka dots, a white collar, and a white trimming around her shirt. Three shoes, black shoes, black and white shoes. Climbing up a ladder. Wow. Amazing work. Great, great. Just amazing post production work, editing work. I'm so delighted to have you both here and ask you more about this. Creating bilingual media content is such a rich area. What advice would you give to new creators wanting to get into it? That's your I was working with Javier and we were thinking about the uh, you know, creative aspect. We would meet with the signer and it was interesting because the signers, ASL coach and ASL directors forgot a key role that was required for everything to really um, tie in together. And, you know, it was funny in that moment when we think about the signer, it would really come down to how their body was positioned. But sometimes if their body was opposite of what was described in the book, it wouldn't really be clear to the viewer. So sometimes that would require us to see if we can flip the camera angle you know, and, and explore on certain techniques that would allow us to make minor changes without having to redo the entire cut uh, without the audience knowing. Um, and as you know, whenever you're on set, it can be very exhausting to your eyes to have to constantly be watching. So I think, you know, giving our eyes an ability to get a break, then when we're editing something, because our eyes are fresher, because we got a break, we're able to pick apart little things that we could have done differently that would have made it a little bit more uh, more clean. So on set, you really have to review the signs and make sure that you're cognizant of how your body is positioned in respect to what is being described mm -hmm. in the story. So that's something that you really have to remember. And then for uh, post or post production, the editing software that I would recommend uh, if you work with uh, Adobe uh, After Effects and uh, Premiere Pro, you can use mm -hmm. Dynamic Link. And Dynamic Link allows you to connect with the After Effects program, which requires a lot of uh, editing. And then you can put it into Premiere Pro and then finally put your tracks in the timeline and get a finished product. So in that 
second part of the process, you can make whatever final revisions that need to be made. Uh, but for the most part, it should be pretty smooth when it's in Premiere Pro. And then once you're content with it, you can export it you know, with a media encoder, which is responsible to convert the video so that it could be compatible with social media platforms or played on a big screen or in a university auditorium where you might have a large audience number. So you can convert you know, how it's supposed to be encoded and then send it out to display your film work. So those are my thoughts. I don't know if mm -hmm. you have anything else to add. Uh, yes. In order to have you receive a high quality production and then having to edit uh, this production, there's not many within our team where we are all together to be able to do this work. We are all working remotely. We are not in the office to be able to do all the editing. So in order for us to have all of this high quality film that has been given to us and uh, edited, uh, it did take more time. We had to convert it into a proxy video to lower the quality of the images to be able to upload it faster and be able to uh, uh, lower the, the editing time. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were required to wait two weeks prior to uh, be able to go to campus to be able to be tested. Now it's uh, a week uh, with the changes in the COVID, COVID restrictions. So we're able to schedule better who is able to come to campus and do the filming. And uh, now that we only have to wait one week, so we have a communication system to be able to do that within the COVID-19 uh, team at Gallaudet University to be able to schedule exact times during the day when we can come in, go to break, have a lunch, come back, and be able to have both the camera person and the talent present. And know that while the camera person was filming, they would wear their mask while the talent would take off their mask. So the camera person would always have their mask on. So again, safety precautions were always paramount, uh, hand sanitizer uh, for any surface. Mm -hmm. Anytime a uh, talent or an actor would come, we would have to clean the entire suite. Yeah, we would clean it down the day before. Anywhere that they put their, you know, coats or bags, we'd make sure to clean it. Um, anywhere that people might possibly want to eat, we'd make sure that to, it'd be sanitized ahead of time. Um, anywhere that the talent would be standing, there was a, uh, a foam mat. And oftentimes people take off their shoes because it's very uncomfortable to stand for hours at a time. But, you know, that mat is something that we would wipe down, including the rest of the room, pretty much. Wow. Amazing. You know, you really drive home how well prepared you have to be for health and safety. Great. Thank you so much. Lauren Brown, Javier Tabares, thank you. Thank you all. Great. So those are the questions we had slated. What amazing answers. I hope you've all learned a lot about what this kind of production process looks like. We're now open for Q&A. We're going to invite all of the panelists to join us now. The audience has a question. What books are you hoping to see uh, be provided in ASL stories? Okay, so now one of the questions that we have from the audience is about what books you want to see made in the future. Thank you. I really hope to see this kind of project become the norm not the exception to the rule and not something that seems a challenge to be surmounted, but a delight to create and, and work on. And I think there's so much vibrancy out there that is needed by these deaf children who are just really thirsty to find themselves represented on the page and in the videos that are related to that content. It's so important that that be a reflective process that 
You know, we create those connections to the world and it makes the world a better place. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that those language foundations are in place for future generations. Anything anyone would like to add? So our next question from the audience is, do you know how many books you are planning on making uh, in 2021? Well, yes, got right, right now we're still working on the last of this series, hoping to be producing, uh, distributing this piece, this book, very shortly. And we have other works in the making. There's one project we're looking into, but have not yet confirmed. So the decision has, has not been made on the particular book, but it's intended to be for families with kids zero to three. So we're really looking at a number of different works and trying to prioritize getting them made. Absolutely. Anyone else would like to add? And Lauren, yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I think we're, you know, still in process, but uh, we're close to finishing. And uh, the, so there's two books that I have in mind that you should be on the lookout for. And uh, we'll be you know, presenting that soon. And uh, once it's available, we'll make sure to market that on social media. That's so exciting. Very much looking forward to it. That's it, Kat. I also want to see more captured books uh, for higher grade levels. Uh, oftentimes uh, within deaf education, uh, we don't have a lot of text chapter books uh, that are used as resources in the classroom for deaf children. So I would like to have those in ASL as well. Uh, I think those are more for third, fourth, fifth grade uh, students, uh, fourth and fifth grade students to really start understanding their academic content in ASL. Because uh, there's a lot of content, complex content that comes up in those grade levels. So I would love to see, again, uh, more of that. Yes, from uh, birth, uh, teaching uh, basic vocabulary, and also for those children who are L1 in whatever particular language. Uh, so I think there's a lot that ASL Connect can do and I hope with the many of one's contributions, mm -hmm. it's just gonna keep growing. Javier. So I came from a hearing family. So now being part of the ASL Connect team and working on this book and looking back on my own experience, with my parents not knowing and not having any access to resources in ASL, me being their only deaf child. So when I was growing up, I didn't have anything. We had to go to uh, college to be able to find resources for me. But now we have this available for deaf children. Uh, here on the web is gonna save time for hearing parents they can just go online and find incredible resources for the deaf children. So I'm um, concerned about this work. Amazing. Franklin. Yeah, I just want to say that we do plan to have more books on a diversity, you know, women, diverse men. Um, LGBTQ topics uh, and include that for you know, family members, because there are times where language is difficult to access at home. And, you know, this could provide an opportunity for deaf children to learn the language, even if their parents aren't deaf, even if they're hearing, they can still share the same language because of what they're learning from the books. You know, the parent can actually become a teacher uh, while they're reading these books. You know, otherwise, there's not that structured time that children have to get these kind of lessons and opportunity to practice sign language. So we want to make sure that there's an abundance of resources available in which children can access sign language while you know doing so with their parents so we'd love to mm -hmm. see that piece in that. i completely agree felicia yeah just to chime on uh to you know what franklin shared diversity is very important and not only when we're talking about physical you know people but also diversity in language you know i'd love to see lsm or other languages be developed and uh, shared when it comes to these signing stories we need to think about how often these opportunities are out there and we know that we need to provide more of these kind of opportunities. So I look forward to you know, seeing more BIPOC uh, talent, editors, language consultants, um, 
more space that's safe for them. And the goal should really be to expand the core team in a lot of these different areas, not only K through 12, but general, you know, uh, people in the community that would benefit from having this as a resource. So with upcoming books, do you expect to have the same centers and on-screen talent or are you gonna be bringing in new BIPOC talent? I can answer that. Felicia? So the current book uh, that we're working on has all types of different signers. The consultant and I, uh, and I, uh, we're the two of us consulting. You know, we have, I have my way of consulting, I has hers, but we expect to see more and more people participating and expanding the pool. And as people gain experience, you know, we can widen who can give that artistic input um, and consult and we can pass the torch. You know, I'd love to see more opportunities for other people who their experiences haven't been represented, share feedback and help us improve the quality of work. Anybody else have other responses to that? Okay, next question. The stories that you're telling and performing, do they really take a lot of changing due to the cultural competency consultants? How does that work? Well, you gotta remember how fast you know time flies by. So when I was asked to, to be a part of it, you have to really know the background of the story first. You can't just sign it without knowing it. You have to really study it. And you know, as you keep doing that, you internalize it. So once you internalize it, then you can, you know, put your feedback in certain documents to prepare for how you'd like to film, uh, acknowledge the different pieces that need to be incorporated as you share feedback and you know, make your suggestions. Then when you meet again in person, you're able to be on the same page uh -huh. and the feedback that you share in person is not gonna be you know, unknown. So it's based off that previous feedback and it just allows for an ongoing kind of feedback process to continue. And when you're working one-on-one, -on -one, it allows for a much closer relationship. Um, I think usually it'll be either two of us or the three of us though, giving feedback to one another. Uh -huh. Alicia? Sometimes the books can have their own hidden metaphors or cultural nuances. And something that I always like to do is have conversations with other people like Nye, like what does this mean to you? So when you read this, how do you kind of envision the author intending us to take that away? Having these conversations allows us to be in a better space. And you know, as talent, we, we kind of walk through what these different signing styles are, not so much to criticize their particular style of sign language, but really to share feedback based on the, on the context of the story and the target audience, right? So if we're working with children that are five or younger, you know, we really have to spell things out that might not be so, uh, so clearly stated in these books. And sometimes in sign language, you're required to truly expand on that content, especially again, when you're considering the target audience can be children between the age of you know, newborn infants to five years old. So we need more of that context being drawn out in a way that's accessible visually in sign language. And you know, sometimes there are questions about to what level of detail you need to make descriptions. And sometimes it's appropriate for you to describe hair color, skin color, you know, visual images uh, that have to do with perhaps race or new words. You know, there are sometimes terms that come are new in society and we know vocabulary mm -hmm. evolves and we need to make sure that sign language is able to keep Amazing. Using. Thank you, Felicia. Okay, next question. Now, how do these stories that you have really get out there? If I want to get them out there, their YouTube, how, how are they getting out there in the world? Thank you for asking. We are still in the process of developing a website for the Claire Center that will be able to host those. As well, we are also sending them out. We have uh, websites and we are adding new pages to that all the time. And so you can find it Claire, you can find it uh, by reaching my office, you can reach it on social media. We want it to be out there for everyone. Now, for those of you who are eager to create new work, new content with a BIPOC 
talent, you have to be able to work with publishing companies and get that together and working on getting ASL English work published. Generally, they will ask for a number of questions, company logo, things like that, and try to work out a lot of those details. And I, I would suggest be very cautious about that process. Uh, we have learned a great deal of lessons about going about, uh, about that process from this. Great, thank you so much. I do have an, uh, another question. Looking back on completing the project, what do you wish you could have improved on? And what was the, the part that you most enjoyed about this process? So on filming day specifically, there was stress about being able to memorize lines and, and, and cues. However, it felt like being a camp and being a kid. Because yes, it was work, but we were really enjoying each other's mm -hmm. company. Wonderful, Lauren? Yeah, like Javier said, it does require a great deal of energy to be able to stand on your feet all day filming and especially when we're talking about the lights getting dim and it can make you a little bit sleepy. But I think the benefit is that, you know, when you make bloopers, that kind of wakes everybody up because everyone kind of laughs and then they kind Absolutely. of get serious and refocus. So it's a constant cycle between laughter and refocusing. But that's what makes it fun. And uh, those little moments where we laugh allow us to get a little energy boost. And, uh, you know, that gives us some sustenance that you know, we can continue filming throughout the day. So looking back, definitely times of laughter gave us some energy, but at the same time, we had to make sure we took care of ourselves by eating right, getting enough sleep the night before, uh, making sure, you know, that, that we're taking care of ourselves, you know, distancing from others that might be sick or that might have COVID, because uh, this is really important. We're thinking about the future of our children's, you know, education. And that's what we need to think about, those future generations of BIPOC and other students. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Francisca? So specifically at the two friends story that was showcasing uh, Frederick Douglass, who is not as popular or as well known as Martin Luther King, uh, who is prominently known throughout the US. There's a statue of Frederick Douglass in Maryland, very close to my house. I go very often and it's a place of inspiration for me uh, of everything, from everything that he did. And I felt like there's more need to expose children to who Frederick Douglass was. He was definitely emotionally charged. Uh, uh, we're still fighting for women's rights to this day. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, I had off to everyone who took part of this story and uh, creating this production. I am happy that now we have this story documented in ASL, showcasing Frederick Douglass for children to know who he was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Felicia. You know, looking back on everything, there was one conversation I had with the signer, my talent on Marco Polo. And it was nice because um, Marco Polo had archived some of the videos so I can look back and remember some of the moments of you know happiness and anger or frustration and laughter and supporting folks the way that I did. And I think in doing so, I finally realized that the presence of a BIPOC person is critical. And looking back, it made me feel like I was a part of the journey with them. So again, I have to just emphasize and underscore that the opportunity for BIPOC to be involved is crucial. And I'm very grateful that all of you were mm. good enough to make that happen. Amazing, uh, Guthrie. Yeah, I'll say one thing I'll look back on about this experience is I've had, you know, cinematography experience, I've had stage experience, and there's so much planning. It's like planning a wedding, a thousand details, every little bit to the groomsman's outfit, to everything. And then comes the time of the performance, and then everyone has the jitters, of course. Everyone's on edge trying to get it right, and, you know, there's the day-to-day -day work of it, the meat and grind of it, the emails, the work, the building up the details and the docs and the scripts and getting the team together. All of that's important to every little piece of that is key to pulling it off in the end. I loved it. So 
So to our last question to our panelists, what would be your dream project? Mm, I got one. Okay, I'll defer to you, Frankly. And, and old Franklin, go for it. Yeah, just a quick answer. I want to see a library, a volume of these storybooks in sign language, supporting our deaf students in a bilingual way for all races, all cultures, all backgrounds. You know, we want to make sure every identity is represented so to include every single student. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'm here. If I had a unlimited budget, if that were the case, I would love to create a 3D version of these storybooks. 3D animation that uh, you are able to capture visually. I think that will be, again, without a limited budget, having a 3D version of these stories. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I think as Javier mentioned, you know, budget permitting, maybe in the future we can set up you know, a sister site or have multiple hubs across the city where we can have diverse signers and they don't have to be limited to the DMV in order to be available. You know, we should be able to recruit talent in different regions as opposed to having a very limited list. So budget permitting, I'd love to see more happening in LA, New York, um, Texas, you know, different parts of the country where we can utilize the network, especially when we think about the access we have to technology nowadays, there's so many resources available. Uh, you can watch someone, you know, live with, uh, even though they might be on the other side of the country, right? So maybe these are some things that we can consider for the future, having like a sister ASL Connect site somewhere. Who knows? Mm. Uh, Francisca. In order to what Javier just uh, said, I know that children love animation. I love an an animation myself. Uh, oftentimes animations don't have captions. It would be great if they, we had ASL animation stories or animated stories. Now, like I said, there's many authors out there and I would love to have an opportunity to get together with them and support uh, authorship uh, throughout the country and have an exchange of ideas and come together as a community to create these stories. Uh, we have to, I know they're looking out for more support and I would like, love to be able to provide mm -hmm. that. Thank you, thank you. And in fact, we do have one more question to ask. What advice would you have specifically for BIPOC in terms of being able to claim space? Specific spaces specifically for areas where there are not BIPOC, correct from the interpretation, to create that space? I think an ASL mentoring program, def, a mentoring program should connect, should partner with ASL Connect to provide mentoring. Uh, different associations, schools for the deaf, mainstream programs need to collaborate with ASL Connect. Uh, this opportunity will allow us to grow our network and the programs that we can provide. And not only in uh, cities, but also being able to do some outreach to uh, the suburban. Mm. Felicia? You can also connect with organizations like NBDA, National Black Deaf Advocates. They've got local chapters. Um, you can also contact other, other groups such as Council de Manos mm. and get involved with you know, projects that they might have you know, follow their pages, see what's going on. Sometimes you need to look at places other than your, you know, uh, frequent sites. So you got to figure out what else is happening in different communities and organizations, have referrals, build your network. That way you can spread more through the organization. Mm. I'm here. Yeah, it's important to create that network. So search, search engine optimization or SEO is something that we can use. Um, for example, here in you know Miami, Florida, sorry, it's warm. I don't mean to brag, but 
over here in Miami, there's a lot of people who, you know, speak Spanish and, you know, I'd say it's at least 80% uh, fluent speaking Spanish. And the people who uh, come here that might not know Spanish are still able to find jobs and learn the language. So I feel like in similar experience when you have children who are born deaf, you know, even though they, they're an immigrant from another country, then being deaf has that unique experience with it. So I feel like there needs to be more variation. Um, you know, perhaps it could be, you know, bilingual in terms of having more English to Spanish, although we know that there are some differences in, in the language. I think having ASL in Miami might be a little bit different, so we can somehow infuse, you know, the, the culture or the language of Spanish into it. So I definitely think that could be a challenge, but maybe there could be two ASL connects, one for ASL and then, you know, ASL connect with, you know, some Latinx infusion or English. Hey. Just a point of clarification, what's so important is really to have everybody open their minds, first of all, because you're going to see and experience encounter resistance, but collaborate, reach across those aisles, get rid of that resistance, open your minds and things will happen. Yeah, bear that in mind. So with this, this concludes our session for today. Thank you to all of the panelists for your contributions. Thank you. We could not have made this happen without you. So once again, thank you all. And with that, goodbye to everyone. This concludes our program. Hopefully you've enjoyed what we had to present on ASL Storybooks. Now we do have ASL Connect Lecture Series coming up and we'll show you a promotion for that next event. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.